recording. Today, we're going to have a reasonably short lecture, so we'll be out here soon. Um, but the topic is can be confusing, so I'll try to go as slowly as I can. It's one single thing, uh, screening tests. And probably it's one of those things that's at, at the heart of a lot of public health epidemiology and somewhat relevant to your lives in general if you choose not to pursue health sciences as a career. Some of the stuff will be useful to you when reading the back of a pregnancy test, as I'm sure some of you have in the past. And if you haven't, maybe you will in the future. I've read many pregnancy tests, my friends. It can be a, a daunting process. So a pregnancy test is a screening test. A screening test is a test that we do that sets up another test. That's a really important point that a lot of students miss every year. They, um, they miss the point that uh, all the math I'm going to present only has relevance if there's a second test to confirm the results of the screening test. So keep that uh, in the back of your minds. We won't be tackling policy around screening tests, but it's something that will come up in discussion, I hope. With screening tests, there's a lot of money that goes into them. A screening test could be something as simple as going to the mall and taking random blood pressure measurements from passers-by. It can be you at home or your parents doing their sugar testing to find out if they're diabetic or something. And that usually requires a follow-up later on. Or it could be um, a digital rectal examination for which you, know, you test later on for the biopsy to see if there actually is prostate cancer. And very often, we in public health have to ask ourselves, what is the benefit, the measurable benefit of these tests, such that it's worth spending money on them? So we have to have measurements, quantifiable indicators, uh, uh, weights that we can apply to say this test is better than that test. This test has clinical value. That test has policy value and so forth. Right? So it's possible for us to develop a screening test, for example, for mad cow disease. I can test all of you maybe with this magical finger test for mad cow disease, but it's very expensive for me to apply it to everybody in the population. And maybe mad cow disease being so rare, it's not worthwhile. So a great test might not be worthwhile if the population affected is quite small. Or, or, or what if I can test for something, but I can't treat it? Is it worthwhile then? Okay. There are lots of diseases we have no treatment for. Is it worthwhile you finding out you have this thing? Maybe if it's infectious. Maybe if it's going to affect uh, society as a whole. But in general, we decide in public health we're only going to test for something if there's something we can do about it. Okay, I'm getting off, uh, off on tangents. So let's begin. Um, anyone know what this is? I've shown this before in other classes. You recognize that reaction? This is actually a photograph of the arm of a friend of mine who is now quite famous. She is uh, head of cancer for WHO. When this was done, she was not. So um, that is an induration reaction. So an induration is um, uh, the raising of the skin as a result of being exposed to something. In this case, it's exposure to the tuberculin bacteria. So we're testing to see if you, in fact, have tuberculosis. So actually, it's not reaction to the bacteria, it's reaction to the, something that tests for the antibodies, the presence of the antibodies of the bacteria. So this is a test for the presence of tuberculosis. And if she were to be found to, to test positive, we'd follow up with a more invasive test to confirm this test. And if she were to test negative, we wouldn't bother. She'd move on. So uh, those of you who volunteered in hospitals know that you probably had to go through some kind of tuberculosis testing. It's kind of uh, de rigueur and mandatory in most hospitals. I was a high school teacher. They required us to have it as well. Isn't that crazy? Uh, I probably got tuberculosis from the kids and give them kids. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So ask yourself this. Is it more important to make sure your positive test is good or is it more important to make sure the negative test is good? By which I mean, what will you be more upset by? if you tested negative and it turned out you're actually positive, or if you tested positive and it turned out you're actually negative. Any thoughts on that? Yeah? Yes, yeah, so you're more upset by that, right? So it's okay then if our failure rate for the positive test is kind of high, but it's not okay if the failure rate for the negative test is kind of high. To explain this better, consider a pregnancy test. So um, if you test positive for a pregnancy and uh, you put on the stick that you pee on, right, and you have the ultrasound, oh, it's, 
it turns out that it was far too generous of a test and you weren't that pregnant. It can be traumatizing, but okay. If it's a negative test, actually pregnancy is not a good example. Uh, something fatal, pregnancy is not fatal. It can be a positive thing. <laughs> if, you find, if you tested uh, HIV tests, if you tested positive HIV and, oh, you're freaking out, that's horrible, right? But then you confirm it later on, you're not. That's actually good news. It wasn't actually positive. But if you tested negative and you found out later that you were positive, that's horrible. So there's a, a, a balancing act with these tests. What matters most to us? Testing positive and, getting, uh, and not having to be real or testing negative and not having to be real? It would be great if both the negative tests and the positive tests were perfect, but they never are. The trade-offs here. Again, I'm ahead of myself. We'll get there. This again, induration reaction. So uh, this poor person, my good friend who I won't name, uh, is now having the size of the induration measured. Now, um, depending on the size of the induration reaction, that's how we know it's a positive tuberculosis test or not. Everyone is going to have some kind of allergic reaction. If it's a really big allergic reaction, then we say it's a positive tuberculosis test. Well, if we did this to the general population, we see this distribution. We see over here, these are mostly the allergic reactions, and this is the actual positive tuberculosis test. So based on this distribution in the population as a whole, we know that an induration uh, diameter of between 12 and 24 millimeters is probably a positive tuberculosis test. And we use that information to go forward to do actual blood tests to confirm our suspicions. And anything less than six millimeters, we assume, is probably just a regular allergic reaction. That's how we use distributions in the population to calibrate screening tests and tests in general. What kind of curve is this? Anyone know the name of this curve? Remember this from your second year stats class? Yes. It's not, it is multimodal, a specific kind of multimodal. How many modes are there? Two, exactly. It's bimodal. It's a bimodal curve, right? Two modes. Now, this is a unimodal curve. There's only one mode. And this is the distribution of systolic blood pressure in, for men in the population. Blood pressure is also a diagnostic test or a screening test, one can say. You test your blood pressure every time you go see uh, your doctor, and they do that to see if there are other issues they need to investigate. Blood pressure is a symptom. It's not the disease. It's a symptom of other cardiovascular issues going on. So how do we know when blood pressure is high or not? Well, we have this cutoff of 120. Where does that come from? It comes from the population distribution, where most people are about 120. So we assume that's normal. So there's an assumption of health that comes out of population averages. That's a little bit of background about how we get some of these cutoffs. Sometimes, if we're lucky, we get this great multimodal distribution with good cutoffs. If we're not so lucky, we get a nice, almost normal distribution that gives us a cutoff based on what's most typical. That's how population health figures into diagnostic criteria. So we have screening tests for things like tuberculosis and high blood pressure. And uh, the challenges are implicit in all these tests. So what is a screening test? It is a test given to people who do not show signs of a disease. If they show signs of a disease, we wouldn't have to screen them. We would go straight to the actual definitive truth test. If you've got like an eight-month bump, we're assuming you're pregnant, we're going to go straight to the ultrasound to confirm. You're not going to bother having a pee on a stick. That, that kind of thing. So it's given to people who do not show outward signs of a disease. And it involves four, at least four dimensions. The first is validity. Do you remember what validity is from your research methods class? as opposed to reliability. What is the distinction between those two? Yes. Exactly right. That is exactly right. There are, there are a host of types of validity. I don't remember if I go into that in this course or not. I've got to look at my notes to see if I'm going to talk about that. There are like a, a whole series of subtypes of validity, and they're not that interesting, but I may talk about them in the future. But essentially validity is, are you measuring what you say you're measuring? I can say, for example, that I'm measuring your intelligence based on nose length. Okay, and I'm going to measure all your nose length. And the bigger the nose, the smarter you, all, you are. I can measure that quite easily. It's a very feasible test to apply. If I measure your nose length several times, it's reliable. I get the same measurement every time. But it's not valid because there is no association between nose length 
and intelligence, as far as we know. Okay? So the two are not obviously related. Validity is, is it measuring what we say it's measuring, and reliability is, do we get the same result all the time? The next two measurements are sensitivity and specificity, and we're going to spend some time talking about those concepts right now. And they're pretty easy. Like with everything else in epidemiology at this level, it comes down to dividing two numbers. And like with everything else, that comes down to deciding on which two numbers to divide. So we're going to draw some tables, we're going to figure out some numbers, and we're going to divide them. And I need you to keep these straight in your mind. Back when I didn't allow cheat sheets on exams, this was a stressful uh, activity. But now you know you can bring things into the exam. So to worry about, don't worry about memorizing, worry about learning. Yes, on your final exam, you'll have a cheat sheet again. Okay, so you can write some shit down, worry about that. So we're going to talk about sensitivity and specificity, something called positive predictive value, and something called likelihood ratio, and how to use those to compute the odds and probability of having a disease before you do a test, and the odds and probability of having a disease after you do the test. Now, I'll prepare you for that right now by saying, a lot of people find that confusing. How does this probability change depending upon my, if I've got the disease or I don't. We're talking about here, at a population level, from the perspective of people making policy, how much additional information does a screening test give us that we didn't have before, that allows us to have a better estimate of the likelihood of people having this disease or not. Hopefully this will become more clear as we move forward. Okay, so like I said, we're looking at... Uh, Sensitivity and specificity, keep these clear. Maybe you've covered this before in other courses. I'm not sure. If not, we're going to go over this in exquisite, painstaking detail. And positive and negative predictive value, likelihood ratio, and these pre and post test conditions. People get these two confused. Don't. They're pretty distinct. Okay. Examples of screening tests. We have the PSA. PSA is the prostate serum antigen. Um, that's a blood test that middle-aged men, like myself, used to get to see if you've got the markers for cancer. And if you do, then there's more invasive tests that happen afterwards. We have CT scans. Right? CT scans show us the like, or strong likelihood of, of damage, often to uh, the head and neck area. And then if damage is shown, there are more invasive tests that confirm if what we see is accurate. Pregnancy test is the classic example. I'll be relying upon this uh, increasingly. So pregnancy test, as you probably know, is involving a woman, not a man, I'm sorry, peeing on a stick and seeing if it shows us the likelihood of pregnancy based upon the, uh, the paper's reaction to the hormones in the urine. And then we confirm that with an ultrasound or other kinds of blood tests. DRE is the digital rectal examination That's there you go, right? And we confirm that later on with other biopsies, etc. I don't need you to know the biology or the physiology. I just bring this up so you understand that there are a host of different kinds of screening tests in society. You've already encountered many of them in your life, and you'll encounter many more going forward in your life and in your careers as health scientists. So they're meant to identify disease in a population early on. Why early on? Because that gives us time to intervene. So what is the point of knowing early if you've got a disease if we can't do anything about it? So does advanced knowledge give us a treatment advantage? If so, then a, treat, then a screening test makes sense. If it doesn't, it does not make policy sense. What makes sense? Well, we want to reduce mortality and suffering. So if we, if we know things early on, then we can do so. So oftentimes, um, tests overdiagnose things. This is very, very common. And as we discussed already, overdiagnosis is generally okay, especially since it leads to a confirmation test later on. So yes, there is some stress that it causes. Oh my God, I think I got the disease, right? And you find out a week later you don't really. I, I, someone I know quite well who uh, was screened positively for pancreatic cancer, which is terminal, and he was freaking out. He thought he's going to die in six months. And then it turned out after it was confirmed, no, the test was just overly generous and uh, he was not going to die in six months. Now, that's a stressful few months waiting for the confirmation to take place, but on the other hand, if the test underdiagnosed, then we'd have a bunch of people who are going to die of pancreatic cancer who don't know about it. Right? So that's, that's the trade-off again. We have misdiagnosis issues sometimes, and sometimes there are adverse effects of the test. For example, a 
coronary catheterization angiogram. Involves sticking a tube through your veins and uh, getting into the coronary arteries of your heart uh, to look for potential blockages. But the act of sticking a tube into your uh, coronary arteries may actually dislodge some plaque and cause a heart attack or a stroke. So on the one hand, you're trying to diagnose something. On the other hand, the diagnosis in and of itself has some risk associated with it. In fact, a lot, of, I would say probably most screening tests involve some degree of risk, but some don't. Peeing on a stick has no risk, right? Getting your blood pressure taken has no risk, but some do. So, and lastly, of course, uh, it's not wise from a policy perspective to screen for a test for which early intervention has no benefit. Why do I want to spend time and money testing you for a thing when I can't do anything about it? You have to wait until it has some true manifestation, then you go to your doctor, get the real test, and then we'll deal with it. Okay, as I'm going to say this again, because some people uh, get confused by this as the math unfolds. Um, screening tests are not diagnostic tests, even though I've used that term a little bit here. They are meant to identify individuals who are good candidates for diagnostic tests. They're the first step in diagnosis. And as we'll see, they're followed up with actual diagnostic tests. So we need to have a measurement of truth when we're doing a screening test. Um, and that's for the purposes of assessing the quality of that test. If there is no assessment of truth, then it's not a screening test. It is the test. It is the diagnostic test. A screening test allows us to do a thing that gets us to measure truth. So pap smear is a test that leads to biopsy, right? So there are elements of, of cancer here. We biopsy a tissue to confirm. So truth is in the biopsy. Home pregnancy test, that's the screening test. The truth is in the ultrasound. DRE, if proper DRE, also leads to biopsy. DRE, diesel rectal exam. I love doing that. Uh, many years ago in the epi class, uh, for some reason, a bunch of students chose prostate exams as their topic for the poster presentation. And one team showed up with uh, plastic guards over their fingers. That was their presentation. They give the entire talk with their fingers out like this. It was quite intimidating. <laughs> okay, so, so let's talk about sensitivity and specificity, our first measurements that we're going to explore in depth. Was that disturbing? Good, good. Get you right. Okay, sensitivity is the probability of correctly diagnosing the disease. I'm using the word diagnosis. Even though I said these are not diagnostic tests, they are detection tests, but from now on I'll, I'll use the term diagnosis. Okay, so probability of correctly diagnosing the disease. The word case here means someone with a disease, who actually has a disease. In other words, it's the proportion of people who truly are diseased, the proportion of truly pregnant women who the pregnancy test detects. We also call this the true positive fraction. The specificity is the converse. It's the probability of correctly rejecting a case, of correctly saying amongst the people who don't have the disease, what proportion of the test accurately say do not have the disease. This is the true negative fraction. Cool. And these are measurements of validity. Another way of thinking about this, uh, sensitivity says if the patient really has the disease, then this is the chances of the test picking up the fact they really have the disease. And specificity is, if the patient really is disease-free, these are the chances of the test actually saying, truthfully, you are disease-free. All right. And as we discussed, we kind of like this to be good. We like to know that a negative test really is negative, so I can go out my life. Okay? And we're a little more accepting when the sensitivity test casts a larger net and catches a lot of things that maybe aren't the disease. So, as with our previous examples, building contingency tables, sensitivity versus specificity for screening tests also has a contingency table, two by two table. And it's important that you set it up like this, otherwise the math will not work. So, the screening test results are the rows. Truth is the column. So, for example, this would be uh, a pregnancy test. These are people who, who tested positive on the pregnancy test. These are people who tested negative on the pregnancy test. These are people who are actually pregnant, and these are people who are actually not pregnant. Okay? And we have A, B, C, and D, and of course our marginals are the same as always. And the math works out like this. 
The sensitivity is amongst people who actually have the disease, what proportion are tested positive by the test. So A are the people who actually have the disease and the total number of people, sorry, A is the number of people who tested positive and the total people who actually have disease are A plus C, so our proportion is that. Similarly, specificity is going to be amongst those who are truly not diseased, how many did the test find were not diseased? Okay. Pretty straightforward stuff. Good times. How do you compute prevalence from these data? There's a sample. We have a sample of people. So uh, let me back up a second. Um, sometimes people ask me, well, where do these data come from? Well, imagine that you are the company that's making this test. And you're going to have to put on the label, these are the descriptors, the indicators, the, the qualities of this test, the sensitivity, the specificity, etc. You're going to have to do some research. So you get some people, you get some pregnant, get some women, uh, and you have them pee on the stick, and then you make sure you take the ultrasound. So that's our sample here. Because in real life, in real life, the ones that test negative don't go on to be tested later. If you pee on the stick and you're not pregnant, you're not going to go to your doctor and ask for an ultrasound. If you test negative on the HIV swab test, you're not going to go to the lab and ask for a blood test to confirm it. Okay? So all these kinds of setups are for a simulation or a, spe a specific case in which the company or the government or someone is trying to compute these descriptors of the screen test. So prevalence is going to be everybody in this sample who actually has the disease. And that's going to be these people divided by everybody in the sample. It's going to be these people. Okay, so all cases, these are all the cases, cases of people with the disease divided by the total population. Cool. Keep that in mind. So, what's a false positive? You've heard these terms before. A false positive are cases in which, or cases is a bad word to use, are incidences in which you test positive on the screening test, but you are not actually positive in real life. So you actually pee on the stick and it says you're pregnant, but you're not really pregnant. You get the cheek swab results back, it says you're HIV positive, but you're not really. That's a false positive. The test says you're positive, but in reality you are negative. Similarly, a false negative is the test says you don't have the disease, but in reality it's positive. And as we've assessed here already, this is a crisis, and this is just stress-inducing. In fact, if this happens to you, you're actually quite thankful when you find out you don't really have the disease. Like, oh my God! Chances are you won't sue until a few months later. It'll take a few months to calm down. Whereas this, that's a tragedy. You don't find out that you have the disease, therefore you don't benefit from the early intervention that a positive test could have got for you. So, false positives. Well, it's a burden on healthcare. It means there are people getting these confirmation tests who don't need them and it costs a lot of money. There's anxiety, like my friend who tested, uh, who screened for likely pancreatic cancer, didn't really have it. And of course, you know, uh, the stress levels are, are extreme. False negatives, on the other hand, in my opinion, and I believe in most of your opinion and the opinion of public health people, that it is a, a tragedy because we have compromised prognosis which prevents us from having timely treatment. Right? That's not good. So, where are the false positives? Well, these are all the positive cases. Which ones are false? The ones that are truly disease-free. So that's where you'd be. Which ones are the false negatives? These are the ones that test negative. Which ones aren't truly negative? Well, these ones are actually positive, but they test a negative. So that's a false negative. So learn how to read the table to get that information take some time to think about it because it's, it's mathematically straightforward. It might be conceptually confusing unless you take a moment to think it through. So now we're going to talk about two other measurements that, that confuse professionals. They confuse clinicians a lot. They don't really understand them. These are the PPV or the positive predictive value and the LR or the likelihood ratio. These are similar constructs. They're mathematically distinct, and they're used in distinctly different ways professionally. So, in general, 
what we are trying to do when we measure these things is you have your doctor discussing the results of a screening test. And if you test positive, what does that mean? What is the true likelihood that you actually have the disease? How worried should you be? That's actually a PPV issue. Right? So if you test positive, what is the true predictive value of that positive test? I'm going to compute that in a second. You actually kind of want it to be low right? if, it, if the disease is a bad thing. If it's pregnancy, it's a good thing when it assumes you want it to be high. So if, if let's say you test positive for some horrible, life-threatening disease, okay? Uh, I don't want to name one in case I traumatize people, but test positive for that thing. You go see your doctor, your doctor says, don't worry about it. The positive predictive value of this test is actually quite low. Therefore, even though you tested positive, your chances of actually having the disease are really quite low. That's a good thing for us. So, in the same, to same token, <coughs> if the test was negative, what are the true chances that you actually don't have the disease? That's the negative predictive value. So there's two of these. There's a positive predictive value and a negative predictive value. On the other hand, we have this thing called likelihood ratio. And this is used mostly by policymakers, by people trying to assess the usefulness of the test, whether or not we're going to fund the test, how much information the test gives to us as decision makers in the world. If you read about this stuff in literature, they will use both of these relatively interchangeably, and it's easy to get lost unless you've got this distinct in your mind. Keep in mind that's also a ratio. You'll see why that is in a second, because we're dividing one thing by another and giving us a pure number. Or is this going to be a percentage? So, the positive predictive value. You also write it this way, the PV positive, the PPV pay-per-view. Also called the precision rate. Everything's got a thousand names. You probably learned already in epidemiology, and that is because the science was invented simultaneously by a variety of different disciplines. We all came to it from different perspectives with their own terminology. So by the time we got it all together sometime in the mid-20th century, it was already too late. But we kind of we kind of settle on this stuff now. And we acknowledge historically it's called other things as well. So this is, if you test positive, what's the probability you actually have the disease? Now that sounds like sensitivity, right? It's not. It's transposed. With sensitivity, it was, if you actually have the disease, what's the probability you test positive? This is, if you test positive, what's the probability you have the disease? Tricky, right? Okay, guaranteed someone's going to screw that up. So, again, try to get that straight. Think about it in terms of rows and columns. With the sensitivity, we looked at in the row, in the column rather, in the column, what's the probability of getting in that first square. But this one, it's the row. And the row, what's the probability of being in that first square? Similarly, the negative predictive value, also called the NPV or the PV minus, whatever you want to call it. If the, if the test shows a negative finding, what's the probability it's truly negative? As opposed to the specificity that said, if you're truly negative, what's the probability that the test will find you negative? Right, so keep that clear in your minds. So, back to our contingency table. Sensitivity again is this, divided by this. Specificity is that, divided by that. Our PPV is the number of true positives. <coughs> What's a true positive? Well, these guys are true positives, divided by the total of true positives and false positives. That. So, it's A over A plus B. See? Sensitivity was this, uh, PPV is that. Similarly, the NPV is this divided by that. Okay? So it's rows, not columns. Now, because they're similar, mathematically, I can rearrange them and get one from the other. So I won't show you how this is done, because you can all do math on your own at home. But trust me when I say that this is also, the PPV is also this. Sensitivity times prevalence divided by blah, blah, blah. The NPV is also that. So these formulas are the same as these formulas. Therefore, if I were to give you any two of these, you should be able to compute the third one. And I would do that because I'm an asshole, as you know. Okay, example time. Uh, 4,810 women take a home pregnancy test and all of them get follow-up ultrasound scans to confirm whether or not they are actually pregnant. 
and the data looks like that. Interesting, right? So uh, only 10 of them were actually pregnant, and of those 10, um, nine tested positive, and one didn't. She's like, ooh, I'm pregnant. Yeah. So let's break down our results and see what we get. So using our formulae, we compute these numbers. Okay, let's interpret that now. I think you know you trust me enough to know that my math is bad, but I confirmed these several times and that's the correct numbers and I have to go through them. You can do that yourself. Let's analyze these numbers. What do they mean? Okay. What it means is if the woman is actually pregnant, there's a 90% chance that the, uh, the test will pick it up. So that's what sensitivity means. If she's actually not pregnant, there's a 92.7% chance that the test will tell her she's actually not pregnant. If the woman test positive though, there's only a 2.5% chance that she actually is pregnant. Well, that's interesting. Now that kind of, that holds true for a lot of screening tests like this. That um, uh, we get a lot of excitement with positive tests, but the follow-up shows us, you know what, the positive predictive value of that test is actually quite low. That's because we made a philosophical choice in public health to spend the money to confirm the positives so that there isn't a whole lot of suffering that results from false negatives. And similarly, if the test shows she's negative, there's a very high chance that she's negative. Almost 100%. Okay, so a negative test is pretty much guaranteed to be negative here. That's how we... So, um, if it wasn't pregnancy, if it was HIV, let's say HIV test, and you test it positive and you want to see a doctor, your doctor says, don't worry, there's only a 2.5% chance that your positive HIV test is real. That's quite difficult. On the other hand, if you test negative on your HIV test and you're still nervous, and your doctor says, don't worry, there's a pretty much 100% chance that that was a good test and you actually are negative. That's the way this works. Okay, what do all of these things ultimately tell us? They tell us what is the likelihood that you have disease from both an individual perspective and a population perspective. So let's talk about the likelihood ratio now. First, I'll show you the formulas. Likelihood ratio is this, these formulas here. Okay, what we're talking about, that's, that's the math. Um, and this is how we uh, interpret the likelihood ratio. It is uh, like this. Anything over 10 means that the test is useful. It's really useful. Strong diagnostic value. A positive result on the test gives me a lot of information clinically and, and policy-wise. Um, if, a, if the LR minus is 0.1 or less, it means that there's also strong clinical value here in terms of making sure that if you test negative, it means something to me. Some people say 5 and 0.2, whatever. That's you know, most of uh, my comings and goings suggest that these are the most common cutoffs. Okay, so likelihood ratio combines information from our test of validity, the sensitivity and specificity, and it tells us how much the chances of you having the disease have changed based upon this new information. Again, this is a little off-putting for some people, but, but either I have the disease or I don't. How, how have things changed? You haven't treated me. I know. Either you have the disease or not, but we're talking here about information. If you just come to me right now and say, what are my chances of having disease X? Well, all I know is the prevalence of disease X, and that's what I apply to you. The prevalence of disease X is 3%. Therefore, your probability of having disease X is 3%. On the other hand, I apply this test, which is not perfect. And based upon the characteristics of this test, the characteristics meaning specificity, sensitivity, likelihood ratio, etc., I know now that because you tested positive, your likelihood of having this disease has increased from 3% to eh, whatever, number, whatever number it might be. So this is all about information and how much additional information the test has given. It's not about how much you have actually changed in terms of your physiological state. You haven't changed. It's how much information I now have about the likelihood of your current physiological state. Okay. So, there's an LR positive and an LR negative. So the LR positive is this, the probability of true positives divided by the probability of false positives. And you can think about it as probable, you know, that, and that's not confuse you further. That's, and, and the same thing here, okay? So let's go through the math and see how this turns out. Um, here are our formulas again, and let's compute the LR positive 
Right? So our true positives are A, our false positives are true negatives are D, we covered that already. Our false positives are B and our false negatives are C. So the probability of the true positives is that, and the probability of false positives <coughs> is that. It's a ratio. So it just gives me that result here. That's how we got that, that formula. It's a likelihood of ratio, it's a ratio of things. So another way of thinking about this, the positive likelihood ratio, the probability of somebody with the disease testing positive divided by the probability without the disease testing positive. Okay, so if I were to only look at the top one and say that what are my chances of testing positive if I had a disease, that's fine. But maybe everyone tests positive whether you got the disease or not. So I need that baseline uh, chances of testing positive to really give me a sense of the quality of the test. And that's what the ratio does. It divides the two, like the, like the relative risk. Everyone's got some risk of getting something. What's your baseline risk? That's why we divide them to get a relative risk. The same here. We divide them to get the baseline probability out of the way. So if our LR is greater than 1, then we say that the test result is associated with having the disease a lot like the relative risk. If it's greater than one, you say that exposure is associated with the disease. If it's less than one, then we say the result is associated with the absence of the disease. Right? In other words, the higher the likelihood ratio, the stronger the suspicion that you actually have the disease. Now, that sounds a lot like positive predictive value, doesn't it? It's very similar, but they are distinct because the positive predictive value tells me the chances that of my positive test being real, and the LR just quantifies how much additional likelihood I have above a baseline. Similarly, the LR minus gives me my suspicion level of not having the disease. I like to focus on the LR positive only. I've described to you the LR negative is. Most people, in my experience, don't actually use it. So for most of the math that we'll do, we'll focus just on the LR positive, the positive likelihood ratio. Another way of thinking about this is the likelihood ratio tells us how much to shift our suspicion. As I mentioned, you have a baseline risk. Your baseline risk is the prevalence of the disease in society. The, the LR positive tells me how much the test allows me to modify that suspicion that you have the disease. Some people use this cutoff scenario. Sure, I like it. Let's use it. It's good. Okay. More than 10 then tells us it's an incredibly useful test. All right. Uh, 5 to 10, moderate useful test. One, yeah, it might be. Okay. So here is the same data we had before. We have our 4,810 women pregnancy test. We have all that data again. Right. Now we've computed our likelihood ratios as well. So, 12 and 0.1, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, it means that there's a 12-fold greater likelihood that a woman who is actually pregnant will test positive as compared to a woman who is not pregnant. What it means? Uh, this stuff will mess with your mind. And same here with L negative, there is a 10%, oh, I'll have a hard time doing this one, 10% Sorry, it's a one hundredth probability that a woman who is not pregnant will not test negative versus those who are pregnant. I will never ask you to interpret that. It gives me a migraine. <coughs> Don't even think about that. Just focus on these guys. Okay. So likelihood ratio shows how much more you are likely to get a positive test if you have a disease against a ratio compared to those without disease. And the PPV tells us the probability of having the disease if you test positive, if that helps you. So the first one, useful for assessing the test from, again, a policy perspective. How great is this test? And the second one is great for clinical guidance. I tested positive, doc, what do I do? And doc says, don't worry about it, 2% chance, you're fine. Right? So that's how we distinguish the two. Now, there is something about the PPV that we don't see in the LR. And that is this. In the PPV, the more prevalence there is, then the more likely you are to get a positive test. 
So it is, it is, it is susceptible to disease prevalence. If a disease is not very prevalent, you are not going to get good return on your investment when it comes to PPV. Likelihood ratio is immune from prevalence. The PPV is very much susceptible to them. So it is maximized when used in high risk populations with high prevalence. So if you're going to screen a population with a very infrequent disease, or like Kreutzfeldt Jakob or something, then the PPV won't be very good and it may actually be a waste of resources. So here's a summary of all the, the, the stuff we just covered. Right? So for example, the fine needle aspiration test, which is a test for, I think it's also a cancer test, followed up on a, a, a biopsy. Okay? So you have the positive negative test and here are the truth. So I did the math for you. You can confirm this on, I encourage you to confirm this on your own. Okay, let's interpret that. So, the LR is going to be the sensitivity divided by 1 minus specificity. So this divided by 1 minus that. And that gives us 11.63. Okay, what do I do with this? First of all, we see that this means this test has a very high diagnostic value. It increases the likelihood that you have the disease by almost 12 times if you test positive. Great. From a policy perspective, this is a great, great test. Now, Let's see how we use this to compute your actual probability of having the disease. To do this, we need to go over some concepts. Pre-test and post-test odds and pre-test and post-test probability. So the pre-test probability is essentially the prevalence of the disease, right? Because you come to me and say, what are my chances of having this disease? Well, how common is this disease in society? That's your probability. The odds are not the probability. Odds are different. Here I've got a definition of odds if you care about that. But if the probability of being female in this class is 0.6, what are the odds of being female in this class? Do you remember your math? All my stats students are avoiding my glare right now. The odds is the probability of something happening divided by the probability of something not happening. So if the probability is 0.6 that you're female, the odds is 0.6 divided by 0.4. So that's why there's different, different constructs here. For the same, uh, the same argument, uh, the post-test probability is after you do the test, how much additional information has been added to your portfolio such that now I think your probability of having the disease is eh. I can also compute the odds for that. Okay. so. First of all, let's do the data here. So the pre-test probability, as I said, is going to be the prevalence of the disease. In this sample here, the prevalence, as we established earlier on in this lecture, is the total number of people who have the disease, 15, divided by the total people in my sample. That's straightforward. So 13% is the baseline risk of having cancer in this population. Pretty high risk, but okay. That's the pre-test probability. So if you come to me knowing nothing else and you're part of the sample, you've got a 13% chance of having cancer right away. Now, once we apply the test, well, before we get there, let's do compute the pre-test odds. Pre-test odds are going to be the pre-test probability divided by one minus the pre-test probability, just like 0.6 divided by 0.4. Here it's 13 divided by 0.87. So one minus 0.13, 15. So that's the odds before we know anything. Okay, so this formula gives us the secret of determining your probability of having the disease after the application of the test. And that is, the likelihood ratio is the post-test odds divided by the pre-test odds. So if I ask you to compute the post-test odds, you're gonna to have to move some shit around, use your LR and your pre-test odds, right? So the LR divided by your, or multiplied by the pre-test odds. Okay. Pre-test odds, 50, we, we established that. Sensing specificity of those numbers, we established that. Compute likelihood ratios, right? We can just divide those through and get this and that. Right? That's straightforward, that's, that's grade three math, it's fantastic. If I know the pre-test odds, as I do, and I know the likelihood ratio, as I do, what are the post-test odds? Well, 
Remembering your basic math again, post-test odds are going to be the likelihood ratio multiplied by the pre-test odds. We computed the pre-test odds, we computed the likelihood ratio, we multiply them, and we get that. That's not, that is useful information, but many people, myself included, have a hard time thinking about odds. I'm not a gambler, I don't think about odds all the time, it doesn't come naturally. So most people have to think about probabilities. So we are now going to convert that to a probability there, because the odds have now increased dramatically. Before you did the test, it was 0.15, now it's 1.74. What does that mean in terms of probability? By the way, um, this example came from the textbook, and the textbook did it wrong. So they multiplied these numbers and got 1.76. So if you see that in your textbook, they are wrong. For once I'm right and the textbook's wrong, usually I'm wrong. Yay, so I got to point that out. I was right once. Yay. Okay, so probably not. odds, there it is. So post-test probability is going to be the post-test odds that we just computed divided by one plus the post-test odds. Don't ask me to derive that for you. It's messy. You can do it yourself. You don't believe me. Okay. So multiply it through and you get this. All right. What does that mean? Before we started all this, we said your baseline risk in this group was 15%. Is that right? 15 or 13? 13? 13%. Sorry. 13%. Which means that if you have done any tests, if it's part of the sample, you, you probably uh, have a risk of 13, that you, you have a 13% probability of having the disease, in this case cancer. If you take the test and you test positive for it, this test being what it is, having the characteristics that it does, having the sensitivity and specificity that it does, allows me now to say that your probability of having the disease is now 64%. That's how much added information has been given by a positive test. A lot of work to get that. That's what it does. It doesn't mean you automatically have the disease. It just means that your probability of having the disease is now 64%. Yes? Did that make on top of the No. It's with. That is correct, yes. So um, the characteristics of the test, the dimensions of the attributes of the test are based upon the population characteristics. So that's a good point, actually. So it's not perfect. It's just based upon what the test seems to be doing with everybody else, uh, your probability has been enhanced by this amount. So it's still not perfect. Okay. It's a good observation. Okay, so these are summarizing all, all what we just did. We can do a similar thing with a minus LR. I hate to. It is, it's a hard thing to interpret. It doesn't really give a whole lot of information, in my opinion. So we won't. So don't bother learning about that necessarily. Focus on the positive Levin ratio. Okay. Here's another example. Here are the results of screening tests, and here are the true disease status. This can be digital rectal exam. It can be pregnancy test. It doesn't matter. And here are all our data there. Okay. Now, the prevalence here is quite small, it's 0.5%. As a result, our positive predictive value is probably not very reliable. Okay. So our, our likelihood ratio is actually quite high, 80. So, so among people who screen positive, 29% are found to have the disease but a positive test result increases your odds of having disease by 80-fold. That's the distinguishing characteristics between the two. That's how they interpret different. Now, so far, we have dealt with dichotomous variables, because they're easy. Either you test positive, we test negative. Either you have a disease, we don't have a disease. But in real life, oftentimes, we apply continuous variables. Okay? So uh, a continuous diagnostic variable is something like this body temperature, on a range of this Celsius, that Celsius, or blood pressure, height, these are all continuous variables. How do we deal with that? For that, we use something called a receiver operator curve, an ROC curve. We will not be doing any computations involving ROC curves here. Don't worry about that. I want you to know what it is. This comes from physics. It comes from um, uh, communications technology. Uh, it's a signal-to-noise ratio kind of thing. So the 
The sensitivity rate is the <coughs> signal rate. The false positive rate, or one minus specificity, is the noise rate. In general, the, the closer this curve hugs the y-axis, the better the test. Because if suddenly the more noise I get, the less signal I get, it's not very good. The less sensitivity I get with more, spe with more false positivity, that's not good either. So we like to have that kind of shape of a curve. How does that work? Well, for the noise, let's say I'm comparing two diagnostic tests. And I have data, let's say it's temperature and my outcome is probability of having a disease. I can graph the two, and the one with more area under the curve has a better signal to noise ratio. It hugs the y-axis more. So that's considered to be the better test. That's how we use a receiver operator curve. We look at the area under the curve. I'll not be asking you to compute that. Just know what it is. All right, we're done. Look at that. So let's talk about some, some, some conclusions here. Important to remember, a screen test is used to identify individuals who will be followed up with. If you test negative, you are not followed up with. <coughs> Second, you've got false positives, true positives, false negatives, and all that great stuff. So get that straight in your head when you look at the Wikipedia table. Um, distinguish between the sensitivity and specificity and the positive and negative, negative PPV. The PPVs are things essentially that your doctor will discuss with you after you test positive. Because you want to know, oh, I test positive, what does this mean? It's relax. The actual likelihood of you actually having the thing is this. And the likelihood ratio is additional information that tells us proportionally how much more or less likely it is that you have the disease based upon positive tests, and we use that mostly for policy purposes. All right, so we have some homework here, and I've got the answers in the final slide there. But that is all, my friends. Not so painful, right? Cool, yeah, maybe? All right, fine. See you.